Hello, today I want to talk about cryogen densities and molecular dynamic simulations and how to put these two together. That is, how do we incorporate additional experimental information in molecular dynamic simulations? How do we steer MD simulations um, by adding extra forces that represent um, cryogen data? Now, what is cryogen data actually and what do we want to do with it? There's a bunch of things we could do. So we um, use cryo-electron microscopy to um, try to solve protein structures. And uh, essentially the first result we get from such a cryo-electron microscopy experiment is a huge stack of images, um, two-dimensional images from which we then reconstruct three-dimensional densities that in some way or the other represent our proteins, um, which are shown in the top left corner. Now, MD comes in from the other side and models the protein's behavior um, under dynamic conditions, so giving things a temperature, or having a look at ensembles and looking at how things would move and um, now we want to bring one thing to the other so this is what we'd like to do here in the first step and uh, you could imagine lots of different challenges to assess and here we start with the simplest one so to say uh, and that is uh, just reconciling the structure you built with the density and so-called fitting what you could also do is of course ask uh, not only what's the single structure but uh, what would be um, all possible structures that uh, would match such a density and um, that's something we can also do up to a certain extent with MD and uh, then of course in a future way and maybe as a possible inspiration for future research what we might want to do is also just uh, maybe just skip densities directly and just jump directly from images to from the raw data to the densities, something um, we cannot do as of yet. So we'll just um, focus on densities. And what are these densities then? These densities are three-dimensional fields. Um, there's a regular grid where each grid point has a certain value assigned to it. So often you see Korean data represented as uh, isosurfaces. But uh, it's more like an X-ray image where each and every point in space gets a value assigned to it and uh, maybe this rendering makes it a bit more clear and um, when we now want to combine SMD simulations with this type of data as you see here for example to um, fit such a protein into a density um, we apply the additional forces that are based on the density and drive the system into the density here and um, there's one choice to be made and uh, this is where I'll drill on a bit more in this talk now and that is a uh, force constant for the forces for the cryem so how much do you trust your molecular dynamics force field versus how much input do you want to give to the cryem data how much weight do you want to give on that input and um, there's different choices you could make. You could choose a very small force constant here and what will happen then is that your protein will see the density um, slightly affected by it but not very much drawn into the density. So um, if you choose too small of a force constant even the protein will be able just to float around in water and um, there will be little effect at all of the aquarium data and uh, then on the other end of the spectrum you could apply quite large forces and what you will see then is that your protein structure which is crammed into the density and uh, will be made to fit at all cost which really might not be what you want um, consider that um, there is a for example some parts of extra density where you will really force the protein to fill in these cavities and extra parts of densities and uh, consider a kind of trade-off between stereochemistry and following the data here so what we want to do is balancing these forces from molecular dynamics and cryem just so that we happen to find the golden middle way between no fit and no structural information. That is uh, choosing the right force constant, K, here. 
And uh, for this, we use uh, some adaptive protocol. And the guiding principle here is that we want to play as little force as possible to push the structure more to its the aquarium density to make it more similar with the aquarium density. And the similarity here in this example just goes from left to right. As uh, you go from left to right, you increase similarity with the density. And this is just a example, a schematic figure. So we want to go up this hill. And um, we start by pushing a little bit. You now there's two different things that could happen. Uh, we could um, apply the kind of biasing forces from the cranium density. And we see that similarity increases, that is, the forces have been high enough, and we can just keep going that way. Or we see another scenario where uh, our little push here was not enough, and uh, we move downhill again. And uh, now, as a response to that, we can either scale up the forces just to push over that hill again, or if we see that our forces are high enough, actually, what we want to do is uh, scale them down a little bit so that uh, we adaptively uh, reduce the force and are sure that we don't distort the structure completely. And by using such an adaptive protocol, we will ensure that we keep just enough force to keep moving from left to right without uh, applying all too much force all the way. And you can imagine even once you're over that hill, then this ball will get rolling, that is, uh, we will just match the density by itself so we don't even need that extra push and uh, then we can even scale down the fitting forces um, even further. So that's a protocol we developed and uh, here you see it applied in a simple case where we just fit a very small helix against a very high resolution artificial density and uh, as we keep going in the simulation we see that we become more similar to the density but since we enforce still more and more similarity what will happen anyway even though we try to be as gentle as possible but um, if we want to keep going to the right as we had in this picture we have to increase the force constant over time so um, what happens initially is uh, just a little bit of movement of the helix will just drastically increase similarity but then as we go further in the simulation, the forces will have to be larger and larger. And at some point, they'll be so large that uh, they overrule the force fields. So uh, the question is how to decide when to stop, even with that adaptive force protocol. And uh, for this, um, we can quantify things a bit more. We can have a look at um, the average potential energy that reflects what the structure is. So that's a running average of the potential energy. And on the other hand, we can have a look at uh, some measure of um, how well do we fit. In this case, uh, using some FSC average, you could choose and think of different measures. And what we want to do here is stop just right when uh, the moving average of the potential energy is just about to explode. And that means that we're cramming in the structure, that we are seeing something that is most likely not biologically relevant. Um, however, this is uh, something we can determine depending on the situation and what type of system you want to look at. And uh, as you see with the balance, uh, we start a simulation, we, um, we just apply very little force and uh, see no structural distortion, easy increase in fitting, and at some point we will have to force and push the system very hard. Now, um, that is a kind of made-up example. Does this work when we go to larger systems and uh, biologically relevant systems? And how challenging can things be uh, to do this? We have a look at um, an aldolized structure, which is a very well-defined system still. Um, need high-resolution density uh, of around uh, 2.1 option. You see here applied and um, what we did to make uh, the refinement a bit more challenging is we distorted um, our lace structure by just heating it up in a molecular dynamic simulation uh, simulated annealing simulation and now have a look at how well can we reconcile and find back the initial structure and as you can see 
um, during the melting process. This is actually expanded quite a bit and uh, also shifted around a bit. And now with this adaptive force scaling, we can also see that even for such a case, we get back to our structure, which should give you um, a good example, for example, uh, for uh, homology modeling applications when your initial starting structure is even a bit remote from what you want to refine and fit. So here you see that uh, we run just normal MD simulations and if you want to do that yourself for your application, it's really just add the density to a normal MD simulation. And all this adding is uh, done in the MVP file, but anything prefix density guided simulation. And uh, if you really are going for the smallest and most kind of lazy possible setup, uh, is really just saying yes to density guided simulations um, by this parameter and adding, uh, of course, your density information as some usual MRC map CCP for um, whatever you like in this case. And uh, then you can run. Uh, if you see, or if you're interested in more information, we put one tutorial uh, that just shows a small test case for density guided simulations on the virtual machines where you can try things for yourself, play around a bit with the options, and um, try things at home. Uh, we also have a bike sale webinar um, on exactly that type of simulations, which you will find on YouTube on the bike sale channel. And, uh, they, I'll go much more to depth and details of all the methods and um, just have a look at the Chromix manual um, where there's an extensive section on all the technicalities of uh, that method um, and all the math and um, formulas explained. Yeah, thanks a lot for listening and hope you enjoy that. Um, do try out the tutorial if you're interested in that type of method or if you just want to play around. And uh, yeah, I'll thank all the people helping the work, especially um, Eric Lindahl and group and uh, people from my PhD time is long ago in Göttingen uh, that helped start up the whole thing. So thank you.